Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yosuke Yamada, a neonatologist and pediatric pulmonologist at Tokyo Women's Medical University. First of all, I would like to thank all the people involved in this conference. It is great honor to give a presentation. Today, I would like to talk about CCHS, um, principles of management and the ventilation, including diaphragm pacing. I have no conflicts of interest. I would like to start with our background in CCHS. Uh, we are the central institution for CCHS in Japan and have treated CCHS from all over Japan since around 2013. This is a map of Japan and the green dots are locations of patients. Until 2021, uh, the number of total cases were 44, including 33 less than seven years of age. We have a lot of experience with CCHS uh, compared to other centers in the world. This slide shows our features of CCHS practice. And the uh, mainstay of practice is CCHS respiratory doc. Uh, which is Japanese English, a um, comprehensive respiratory checkup program for management of respiratory care. Docs refers to a dockyard uh, where ships are examined and repaired. So um, respiratory doc resembles the place and the program for a total medical checkup for CCHS. Through this program, uh, we decide on the appropriate respiratory care or settings of respirators and so on. And uh, since 2020, uh, we have studied the introduction of diaphragm pacing, which has many possibilities for improving the prognosis and QOL in CCHS. I will talk about this new technology in the latter part. But this is the content of my talk. First, I will show the characteristics uh, related to respiratory management found by the respiratory doc. Next, I will explain the principles of respiratory management. Uh, this section includes how to select and transition respiratory care. Finally, I will introduce the new respiratory management, diaphragm pacing, uh, showing our two cases. <coughs> Sorry. Let's start with characteristics related to respiratory management. Uh, first, as a brief review, uh, the pathophysiology of CCHS. CCHS uh, lacks the ventilatory, uh, ventilatory response to hypercarbia and hypoxia due to a congenital disorder of the respiratory center. And therefore, hyperventilation of CCHS is without respiratory distress. And hyperventilation uh, occurs uh, mainly during sleep, uh, but in severe cases, it occurs even during wakefulness. If the patient are ventilated appropriately, the prognosis is not bad. However, uh, developmental delay and pulmonary hypertension due to hyperventilation are often seen uh, even in recent years. This slide shows uh, respiratory care in CCHS. There are mainly three ways and TPPV, NPPV, and, and diaphragm pacing, DP. Each way has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, TPV is the best airway management, the most reliable and stable way of ventilation. However, uh, patients with TPPV tend to suffer from lower airway infection and have limitations in daily life, such as in speech, swimming. Uh, on the other hand, NPPV has fewer limitations in QOL, uh, but there are some points to note in NPPV. Stability of ventilation with NPPV is lower than that of TPPV. Fitting the NPPV mask is often difficult, especially in infants. Uh, patient with CCHS has no respiratory distress, so NPP is only a nuisance for them. Uh, for infants. But the last one is diaphragm pacing. Diaphragm pacing is the smallest and uh, portable device, so it is useful to ventilate outside the house or during wakefulness. 
disadvantages of DP is lack of experience. In Japan, we have just started to use it. From here, uh, finding from the respiratory dock. This is the slide uh, of the ventilatory response to CO2, uh, VRCO2. It is a value uh, obtained from the relationship between ETCO2 and minute value and is calculated by this formula. It calculates uh, the increase in ventilation in response to an uh, increase in blood CO2, which is shown, uh, which is shown as a slope uh, of minutes volume and ETCO2, like in this figure, uh, slope. And this picture shows how we measure the VRCO2. We make a closed circuit like this picture, and the back is filled with 5% CO2 and 95% O2. And the patient releases this gas and to accumulate CO2 while the minutes volume is measured. And this graph shows the results of VRCO2. And we compare the VRCO2 of uh, CCHS uh, with those of normal infant and the preterm infant, which has respiratory center immaturity. The median VRCO2 of CCHS was 4.16, which was extremely low compared to those of normal and the preterm infants. This result showed uh, how severe the disorder of the respiratory center of CCHS is. And here, I will also show you how severe hyperventilation in CCHS is. This slide shows SpO2 monitoring uh, during sleep without a ventilator. We classify the severity by the cost of SpO2, like in this slide. And the mild type is defined as a case where the SpO2 stayed over 90%. This is a moderate type. Uh, where the SpO2 state in the 80s. And this is a CD type. Uh, the monitoring was terminated because of a severe drop in SpO2 and to the 70s. And soon after dislodgement of the ventilator at this blue arrow, about a minute. Of all CCHS, 80%, 80% were moderate and severe cases. This result showed uh, most of CCHS patients have to be ventilated strictly. Next, and I would like to introduce hyperventilation during wakefulness in CCHS. As I mentioned above, hyperventilation during wakefulness is seen in severe cases. This patient was monitored uh, while well awake and watching TV or smartphone. We monitored for two hours and the average SpO2 was 90.2% and the average TCPCO2 was 84.0 millimeter mercury. Interestingly, um, hyperventilation during wakefulness was unnoticed uh, by either the patient or his physician until this examination was performed. Hyperventilation during wakefulness is difficult to recognize without monitoring, without this monitoring, because CCHS patients don't have respiratory distress. And this graph shows um, the ratio of patients with hyperventilation during wakefulness. 62% uh, of cases had hyperventilation during wakefulness. I would like to highlight uh, in 13 of the 16 cases and 80% of cases with hyperventilation during wakefulness, hyperventilation was not recognized and was untreated before the doc. And more importantly, hyperventilation and during wakefulness could be related to developmental delay. Uh, we should consider whether these patients need to be ventilated when they are awake. From here, uh, based on the finding from the respiratory doc, I would like to explain the principles of respiratory care, selection and transition of ventilation, uh, ventilation method. 
This is one of the key slides today's talk, uh, the principles of respiratory care. Here, I will indicate the recommended respiratory care by age group. And during infancy, the first choice of respiratory care is TPPV. Stable and reliable respiratory care is most important. After late infancy or school age, uh, NPPV uh, could be considered as an alternative respiratory care. The transition to NPPV um, should be performed under certain conditions, such as no need to be ventilated during wakefulness and so on. Under DP, uh, diaphragm pacing could be a choice from adolescence. DP is selected for ventilation and during uh, DP is selected for ventilation during wakefulness or uh, weaning from the respirator for a better QOL. From here, I will explain more in detail. Firstly, the first choice in infancy is TPPV. The reasons are shown here. It is important uh, to ventilate securely and strictly for appropriate growth and uh, development in this age. The existence of hyperventilation during wakefulness makes the use of NPPV difficult. And the infants sleep many times and a long time a day. And the guardians have to use a ventilator each time. In addition, infant uh, dislike the fit of the mask or the airflow from the NPPV ventilator. As a result, uh, the guardian's compliance of using the ventilator tend to be low. This leads to chronic hyperventilation and result in poor neurodevelopmental prognosis. So um, I recommend uh, in this age uh, TPPV. Also, TPPV is a better ventilation method in infancy. Uh, NPP is also a good way of ventilation, especially for a better QOL. It is considered that NPPV uh, is suitable um, from late infancy or school age. The sleep wakefulness rhythm is established by about late infancy, and the patient understands the need for NPPV. So the effort needed in using NPPB for infant uh, decreases. And the facial, uh, facial deformation is an important complication of NPPB, uh, but the effect of compression to facial bone by face mask decreases by late infancy. And ventilation by NPPB get easier to manage after infancy. When we consider transition to NPPD, uh, we have to evaluate three major indications. First, uh, the absence of severe hyperventilation during wakefulness. Patients with hyperventilation during wakefulness uh, need to be ventilated even, even in, in during wakefulness. So, uh, but it is difficult to ventilate by NPPD during wakefulness. Second, an absence of severe airway lesions. Patients with severe airway lesions, which disturb airflow from the ventilator, are not suitable for NPPV. Finally, acquisition uh, of sufficient development. As I talked earlier, the patient has to understand the importance of using the NPPV uh, by themselves. It is very important. Uh, in cases that meet the uh, indications, uh, we proceed with the transition like in this slide. And what we have to do first is to make the patient uh, get used to the NPPV device by just applying the mask and uh, not starting NPPV. After getting familiar with the NPPV device, uh, we will start ventilation uh, by NPPV with the tracheostomy still in place and a change to thin tracheostomy tube. We will only use NPPV for a short time when beginning NPPV. And we will then gradually increase the time on NPPV. Finally, tracheostomy is closed after accomplishing, accomplishing uh, full-time NIPPV. 
And we recommend uh, spending one or two seasons with these procedures because it is better to experience several events uh, such as cold or bad temper, which disturb the uh, use of NPPP. And this is the third respiratory management following TPPP and NIPPD, uh, DP. We use a new RxDPS diaphragm pacing system and in Japan. And DP generates uh, breathing uh, by sending signals for, uh, through electrodes uh, implanted into the diaphragm and from an external pulse generator. The pulse generator is small, uh, palm size, and uh, its weight is uh, 204 grams without the battery. C battery can drive DP for about uh, 90 hours. And medical insurance coverage for CCHS and SGI started in Japan in uh, 2090. And DP was implanted in two CCHS cases and the three SCI cases until 2022. And all of these two cases of CCHS are my patients. And this is also a key slide. Uh, this video shows uh, DP in action. In the video, um, my explanation is in Japanese, but please ignore that. And at the beginning of the video, start, yes, start. And the pulse generator is on and the diaphragm contraction by pacing is seen. Then I switch uh, the generator off. After that, diaphragm contraction disappeared. So uh, this small box and the rectifier read takes place of the ventilator. DP can ventilate anytime and anywhere. Uh, please take a look again, contraction by pacing. Um, this one, this one, this contraction is uh, from DP. Next, uh, this is the final section, uh, the introduction of DP with our cases. This is the flow of DP introduction. First, uh, we evaluate the indications for DP as described in the next slide. Then an implantation is performed by laparoscopic surgery. It usually takes about two hours. Next, uh, we start using the DP uh, a few days after surgery and perform conditioning, uh, deciding on the initial setting and gradually increasing the setting and the time uh, for about two weeks. After conditioning, and the patient goes home and start using DP at home, at house. And these are the indications for DP in CCHS. As a basis, uh, general condition well enough to tolerate uh, laparoscopy and the development to the degree of school age are needed. New RX uh, DPS has electrodes uh, coming out from the abdomen. So patients have to be careful not to pull out the electrodes with or without intent. And uh, there are two types of indications. One is for treatment, the other for better cure well. The indication for treatment is hypoventilation during wakefulness. DP can ventilate anytime and anywhere, and it is useful in CCHS with hypoventilation during wakefulness. Indication for beta QOL is weaning from the ventilator or closure of tracheostomy. If the patient used DP during sleep, uh, they could be weaned off completely from the respirator a ventilator. If patient desire transition to NPPD, but unable to use NPPD successfully uh, due to reasons such as developmental delay, a safer tracheostomy closure could be performed with DP without using uh, NPPD, only uh, with DP. From here, um, I will explain the actual implementation of DP in our cases. 
And the patient, uh, 33 years old with TPB female and 24 years old male with NPPV. Although both of them uh, had hypoventilation during wakefulness, they used the ventilator only during sleep. She had normal de uh, development, but had pulmonary hypertension due to hypoventilation during wakefulness. And he had mild developmental delay, but he did not have pulmonary hypertension. This is a video of the laparoscopic surgery in case one. This video shows diaphragm contraction by BP. And uh, this is a liver and the back is diaphragm. And uh, these, uh, these are the electrode and electrode, electrode leads uh, implanted into the diaphragm. And uh, let's start the video. This one, this, this movement is uh, the diaphragm contraction by DP. Again, this one. Uh, the contraction appears to be quite strong uh, because the contraction is tested in the strongest setting during surgery, not for uh, usual use, usual setting for, uh, not for normal setting, strongest. After surgery, we started the conditioning. We gradually increased the time of using DP from one hour per day to over 12 hours uh, per day and set the DP appropriate ventilation and monitoring SpO2 and TCP CO2. The course of conditioning in each case was similar. DP was started on the same day three and the DP was used for more than uh, 12 hours around the day 10. The appropriate setting was achieved in around, uh, around two weeks, and the home use was started uh, on day 16. Subjective symptom was the only difference. Case one had pain around the shoulder and the abdomen, but uh, it was there was uh, there was uh, tolerable. Now, uh, after starting DP home, they are using DP without major adverse events. This slide shows the improvement of hypoventilation during wakefulness by using DP in case one. The left figure is the monitoring of SpO2 and TCPCO2 without DP, and the light is with DP. The average SpO2 without DP was 92.1%, and while that with DP rose to 98.5%. The average TCP CO2 without DP was 67.0 millimeter mercury, and that with DP was 59.0 millimeter mercury. This improvement is seen easier in trend, uh, in trend of SpO2 and TCP CO2, like in this figure. And the uh, improvement was more dramatic in case two. The average SpO2 uh, increased to 97.0% from 90.2% uh, before DP. As for the CO2, the average decreased to 47.1 millimeter mercury, almost normal range, uh, from 84.0 millimeter mercury before DP. The improvement was also obvious from the trends. Both two patients and of course myself are very pleased with this improvement. And case one had also pulmonary hypertension and this slide showed the improvement of P uh, pulmonary hypertension evaluated by TRPG on echocardiography. During this period and uh, colored in pink and uh, before using DP and her TRPG was 60 to 100 uh, millimeter mercury, much was higher than the, uh, than the reference value. She felt fatigued uh, during exertion, such as going upstairs, oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, felt fatigued during exertion at this point. And after she was well ventilated by DP, the period in green, this green area, 
her TRPG was uh, continued to decrease and to reference value in six months, and her symptom of feeling tired uh, also tended to improve. We started working on the next indication, weaning from the ventilator uh, after achieving uh, successful management of hyperventilation during uh, wakefulness. It is six months after the uh, introduction of DP. And this video shows her sleeping without a ventilator uh, with DP, without ventilator with DP. So like in this video, uh, although she slept with no respirator, and uh, but uh, her respirator status was very good, and uh, her SpO2 was, SpO2 was, uh, this one, 98% and the pulse rate was 70 times per minute. The situation in this video is like magic or a miracle for the medical staff associated with CCHS. This is a monitoring of that night without ventilator with DP. Uh, she slept a uh, good eight hours and the average SpO2 and TCPCO2 were 98.2% and 43.2 uh, millimeter mercury, and she was well ventilated by DP. And she said that uh, last night was the first night without respirator since she was born, and she never saw this day would come. I was very happy to hear this and strongly felt uh, I would like to spread. I have, to, I must to spread DP safely to many patients in the future. I would like to finish my talk with this summary. First, I show the respiratory findings related to respiratory management from the respiratory doc. Hyperventilation in CCHS is severe and the hyperventilation occurred even during wakefulness. In the next section, I explain the principles of management and ventilation in CCHS. The first choice of ventilation is TPPV, um, at least during infancy, and the transition to NPPV is suitable uh, after late infancy with caution. And finally, uh, I introduced a new mode of respiratory care, diaphragm pacing. And DP can improve the prognosis of CCHS uh, by improving the uh, hyperventilation and the quality of life uh, by enabling ventilation anytime and anywhere. These are the last two slides of acknowledgement. I deeply thank uh, all CCHS patients and the families, especially those who are the first and the second cases uh, in uh, second cases of DP in Japan. And I also want to thank all our team members, doctors, nurses, clinical engineers, and manufacturers, all members. And these are also my patients and families. I want to be of help to everyone for a better future. That is all I have to say. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you again for honoring me with an invitation to speak. I just wish it was face to face. And I hope a happier time will come when it will be face to face. And I make new friends and see my old ones and just enjoy your wonderful country. So childhood interstitial lung diseases, it's a huge topic, and mine is necessarily going to be a personal selection. I have no personal or institutional conflict of interest with regard to this presentation, but I'm a member of a number of European-wide groups studying interstitial lung disease, uh, none of which pay me any money. So the aims of the presentation, I'm going to start with a background of when to suspect interstitial lung disease and how to go from there. I'm going to discuss the changing paradigms of the investigation of these entities and show that we've got to move to molecular precision rather than 20th century pattern recognition as specific molecular therapies are becoming available. And I'm going to illustrate this in particular with neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia of infancy 
pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and a large number of genetic disorders. So the new roadmap, what is the spectrum presentation and approach of interstitial lung disease? The presentation is extremely nonspecific. In the history, unexplained neonatal respiratory distress in a term baby, or in the infant or older child, either a classical respiratory presentation with breathlessness, increased work of breathing, oxygen requirement, but sometimes with non-respiratory presentations, failure to thrive and poor feeding. The examination may be normal. There may be cyanosis, recession, crackles or hypoxemia. The chest radiograph may be normal or very non-specific shadowing and detailed further investigation is essential. Anybody can see that this slide is entirely non-specific. You cannot make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease from these three features. So my starting point for the paradigm is that a child interstitial lung disease is suspected and it's confirmed on CT scanning. The next round of tests are non-invasive tests such as blood tests, possibly other imaging, and a really detailed look at the environment. Next, we may proceed to invasive tests, including bronchoscopy and lung biopsy. But the end point is a specific diagnosis, hopefully with a specific treatment, something genetic, environmental or other cause. Now, some conditions, no biopsy is needed. Here you can see, for example, a CT scan which shows diffuse, soft, intralobular, fluffy shadows. This is extrinsic allergic alveolitis, but we need to know what the underlying cause is. What is the allergen? Is this a telomere mutation? Here you can see a CT scan showing ground glass shadowing in the lingular and middle lobe with volume loss and some perihyla shadowing. This is neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia of infancy. But the next question is, what is the endotype? What is the underlying cause? Here again, you can see a diffuse ground glass shadowing with this outlining of the secondary pulmonary lobules. This is cobblestone appearance. This is pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which I shall return to. You don't need a biopsy to see that this is pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, but you do need to find out what is the underlying cause. And finally, here you can see a mixture of nodules and cavities with a pneumothorax. This is Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So there are some specific CT findings that will help you, but more often than not, much more often, the CT will confirm that there is interstitial lung disease, but you will not be able to make a specific diagnosis. So blood tests would include those for systemic inflammatory disorders. I don't propose to spend a lot of time discussing this. If you think in particular the interstitial lung disease is complicating a systemic vasculitis, you will be wise to involve a paediatric rheumatologist. And in all cases of interstitial lung disease, consider whether there are ocular, joint or skin manifestations that would point you to a systemic disorder. These are some of the blood tests that can be done and the underlying diagnoses, but the list is getting longer every day. I now come to some of the genetic disorders and particularly the surfactant protein abnormalities. As you know, surfactant protein B and surfactant protein C are the surface active surfactant proteins that stop our lungs collapsing uh, when we breathe. Surfactant proteins A and B are part of the innate immune system, the collectin family. But interestingly, interstitial lung disease is associated, at least in adults, with surfactant protein A. So surfactant protein B and C are expressed under the control of the transcription factor TTF1. And they undergo intracellular processing uh, with ABCA3, which I will come back to. The surf mature surfactant protein is partially cleared by the mucociliary escalator. But this is only a minor component because in primary ciliary lytic kinesia, there is no surfactant protein phenotype. It's also engulfed by macrophages and it needs the CSF receptor A and B in order to do this. This gives us a total of six genes involved in, in, in surfactant, mutations of which can cause interstitial lung disease. 
So what are the disorders of surfactant production? The first is surfactant protein B. This presents as neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. It's an autosomal recessive with more than 40 mutations described. Uh, two thirds of the known mutations are one to one ins two. However, in 30%, no gene is discovered and immunostaining makes the diagnosis. It's rare. It's fatal without a lung transplant. There are rare long-term survivors in partial forms of this condition. ABCA3 can present with neonatal respiratory distress, but also with interstitial lung disease later on. It's a large, complex gene with more than 200 mutations described, and it's probably quite common, one in 10 to 20,000. 60% of these die early, and if they present early with two severe mutations, they are dead within a year. But long-term stability in late presenting disease is well described. The next group is surfactant protein C. This can present at any age. It can present as non-resolving RSV bronchiolitis. It's an autosomal dominant with more than 60 mutations described. The incidence of gene, gene abnormalities is not known. And the prognosis is variable. And this is important because neonatal cases may survive long term, quite unlike neonatal presentations of ABCA3 and surfactant protein C. Um, finally, NKX2.1 or TTF1. This presents at any age with a large number of different mutations. It's a dominant. It's, it may be associated with career, thyroid disease and ataxia but it may be an isolated phenomenon. You may get just interstitial lung disease with no other manifestation. Disorders of surfactant catabolism, as I've said, the CSF2 receptor A and B, the alpha subunit, is, they're both recessives. They can present at any time. CSF2RA, if there's a lot, part of a large deletion, may be extra pulmonary involvement. And there are numbers of very rare conditions, which I've just put up there. I'm not going to talk about them in detail because I don't have time. Things like GATA2, OAS1, SCL7A7 and MARS, all of which are disorders of surfactant protein catabolism and can present in early infancy or later on. Some are associated with immunodeficiency. And the importance of this is that there may be specific treatments, things like lung lavage, stem cell transplants, specific monoclonals. And the point about making a rare genetic diagnosis is if there's a treatment for it that's specific, that diagnosis is well worth making. But one of the things that's really important is that the pattern of interstitial lung disease may differ across the world. And for the young investigators, the, the ILDs that I see in London may be very different from what is seen in the Philippines. Go and look and find what is Philippine interstitial lung disease. So this is an Indian survey, over a thousand adults seen in a large number of Indian centers. They also liaised with the USA, Washi and Seattle. There was a central Indian registry all had the serology, spirometry and CT, and an independent review of diagnosis. And may I stress that independent reviews of diagnosis is so important in paediatric interstitial lung disease. They are rare conditions. We all review our cases with other people, and we're always happy to review a case of interstitial lung disease in our online conference, which you can join. Just get in touch with me. So what did they find? they found nearly half had hypersensitivity to pneumonitis, an extraordinarily high proportion. Half of these were related to air coolers, uh, as you can see here, and we don't see these in England. So how could we possibly see this interstitial lung disease? So air coolers, air conditioners, birds, moulds, lots of different exposures. Of course, some had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and connective tissue disease, ILD, but it was a very different pattern of diseases. Uh, also remember other causes of interstitial lung disease. This is a six-year-old child with microcephaly and spastic quadriplegia, choked on feeds with a history of cough, obviously aspiration, but it wasn't. 
So there's the CT scan. This is nothing like aspiration. You can see patchy areas of ground glass consolidation in the upper lobes from dilated airways. And this child had a single kidney and had been prescribed an antibiotic. And this was nitrofurento in lung. This is the as a case series from Red Cross Hospital in South Africa. Twelve children from Zimbabwe in the first year of life, presenting with respiratory symptoms. Six of them had been hospitalized for pneumonia, and this was the x-ray. Seeing they were all from Zimbabwe, we wondered about a genetic cause. You can see here some extensive consolidation, more on the right than the left. Is it genetic or environmental? Well, here's the CT scan, and you can see airspace opacification with areas of low attenuation shown in the, by the blue arrows consistent with fat. And when they were invasively investigated, a bronchoalveolar lavage was milky. You can see fat globules here, and a lung biopsy again showing a lot of fat. And this was extrinsic uh, lipoid pneumonia due to oily laxatives. Never forget e-cigarettes. I don't know if you have them in the Philippines. If you don't, be very careful because they will certainly try to sell them to you. Acute exposure to e-cigarettes can cure multiple lung diseases. I don't ask you to read this slide, but just to appreciate the extraordinary and different acute toxicities of e-cigarettes. About 80%, but not all of them, the reason is that they are cut with cannabinoids, and it's a mixture of e-cigarette liquid and cannabinoids, but 20% it's just e-cigarette liquid. The liquids and devices are very dangerous. And if you see a child with a funny respiratory illness, ask yourself, could this be due to e-cigarettes? And here's one case of a young adult. You can see the extensive ground glass shadowing, air leaks, lung destruction, it's difficult to believe that this is going, young man is going to do well long term. So what is the role of lung biopsy in the 2020s? So it's not a gold standard, but it's part of the picture. It's a staging post on the diagnostic road, not the end of it. Be aware that the same morphological pattern may be caused by multiple different gene mutations. The same gene mutation can cause multiple different biopsy abnormalities. And if you re-biopsy, the pattern may change. The biopsy may point the way to further investigations, for example, immunodeficiency, or point the way to specific genetic studies. In the USA, uh, the, Lisa Young showed me these data, um, over 400 cases in their registry, less than half were biopsied. And you can see, you can see that 51 of their 415 cases had informative genetics and therefore would not need a biopsy for a diagnosis. So other genetic disorders with prominent pulmonary involvement. Um, FOXF1, which is a transcription factor, presents typically very early on with severe pulmonary hypertension and cardiac and, and gastrointestinal and genital urinary abnormalities. Uh, it's a spectrum of asthma dysplasia, alveolar capillary dysplasia, and alveolar capillary dysplasia with so-called misaligned pulmonary veins. It presents early, rapidly progressive to ECMO, and the genetics are very complex. FOXF1 is the usual cause, but many of the abnormalities are outside the gene in, and in the promoter region. Uh, and if you look here you can see a vascular endothelial marker. Uh, you can see the, the brown staining is very far away from the primitive air spaces. And if you look here, you see the pulmonary veins, the pulmonary arteries and the bronchioles in the bronchovascular bundle together instead of the pulmonary veins being peripheral. So think of FOXF1, think of STRA6 and other mutations. Recently come on the scene, FNLA, uh, a, a, a filament mutation. It's an acting binding protein. It's an excellent dominant and it's a growth disorder. The characteristic features include periventricular nodular heterodynia. And here you are, it presents with early respiratory distress, but one of our cases that was diagnosed only after she was pregnant with a child with this condition. So here you can see the periventricular nodular heterotopia on an MRI scan, absolutely classic of the condition. 
and the lunch. The CT will show atelectasis, cysts, emphysema, trachea malacia, pulmonary hypertension as a feature, and late presentation is described. <coughs> Superficially, this looks as if it could be congenital lower emphysema, but it's multifocal and there are airway abnormalities, which is not characteristic of congenital lower emphysema. Other conditions, again, integrin mutations, copper, TMM173 or sting, LRBA, a number of very rare conditions. And again, some of these will have specific inhibitors that could be very valuable. So tofacitinib, for example, for TMM173. So there is a point to making these very rare diagnoses. And this is illustrated GATA2, with this GATA2. GATA2 is a transcription factor. Um, for, in this case, four patients with early onset of interstitial lung disease with a GATA2 gain of function mutation. These patients are often immunosuppressed first. But there are specific therapies, anti-IL-6, tocilizumab, serolizumab, and JAK inhibitors such as ruxolitinib, baricitinib, tofacitinib, and apodatacitinib. Usually starts with tocilizumab, but usually need a JAK inhibitor. So here you can see a child with GATA2 who's got diffuse ground glass shadowing and really has not responded to an anti-IL-6 strategy. But here you can see after more than three years of, of uh, ruxolitinib, there's dramatic clearing of the, of the changes and the extra pulmonary manifestations also improved. So GATA2 mutations are, of course, very rare, but there is a specific treatment. So it's well worth thinking about them. And one of the key messages of this talk is that you must involve your geneticists in the investigation of interstitial lung disease. Immunodeficiency in child. We all know about opportunistic infection and bronchiectasis as a manifestation of immunodeficiency. But diffuse lung disease is also caused by immunodeficiency. A quarter in those of 0 to 2 and half of those in children 3 to 18 years. And the immune dysfunction may not be readily apparent. They may actually present with interstitial lung disease. And there's emerging evidence of promising clinical responses to targeted immunomodulation. So here are CT scans from children with different primary immunodeficiencies. Nothing very specific about any of them, all abnormal. The seven-year-old bottom left with this dramatic CT scan actually had very little in the way of symptoms. However, lung biopsies may be a clue to immune dysfunction. So things like lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, lymphoproliferative disease, cellular NSIP, follicular or cellular bronchiectasis, and GLILD, granulomatous and lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. If you see one of those, you get your immunologists involved and tell them there's a diagnosis to be made and they need to find out what it is and make the diagnosis. So we need to, I've said, go beyond pattern recognition to endotypes. And I'm going to illustrate this new modern approach to interstitial lung disease with two conditions. So in neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia of infancy or NEHI, I'm sure many of us will have seen cases, typically presents early with tachypnea and oxygen dependency. The lung biopsy, if you do one, is normal. But if you stain it with bombesin, as shown here, you can see neuroendocrine cell positivity in the airways. Many of these patients will not have a biopsy because the CT diagnosis is, is straightforward. And you can see here, you've seen the CT before, middle lobe and lingular ground glass shadowing, peri higher changes with peripheral sparing. And the prognosis is generally very good, but they may be oxygen dependent for a long time. But Lehi, I'm going to show you, is an umbrella term. I do not consider it a diagnosis. First of all, what is the significance of these bombosin positive cells? So Lehi, as I've said, is increased numbers of bombosin positive cells with morphologically normal or near normal lung. But there is no quantitative cutoff in the literature, and there's overlap between what is called knee high and normal and normal lungs. 
And when we looked in our in our series, we found we found that some disorders had similarly high knee high levels. Um, so it's the fact that protein mutations, follicular bronchiolitis, pulmonary interstitial glycogenosis. Obviously, there was no danger of mistaking them for knee high because they had additional pathology. But they had just as many knee high cells as some of the knee high patients. And whatever disease subgroup you looked in, the number of neuroendocrine cells decreased with age. And the pig, it's the fact that protein mutations are known to be associated with lung immaturity. We think, in fact, that these neuroendocrine cells are actually a manifestation of airway immaturity, a marker, if you like, of persistence of the fetal airway. You see these cells in the airway in, in uh, normal lung development. And this is a now a family kindred, very interesting. The proband at seven months of age was diagnosed as knee high on the basis of a typical biopsy seen here and a typical CT scan. This child was in daytime oxygen until age four, nocturnal oxygen to 17, and five close relatives had failure to thrive and infantile respiratory symptoms improving with age. And you can see the family tree here. And in this group, they found in a highly evolutionary conserved region of NKX 2.1 slash TTF1, there was a mutation. It was present in all the relatives with respiratory disease and none without this history. One other family had knee high on biopsy. And you can see here, therefore, that typical knee high can be caused by an underlying gene mutation. This was, an, again, a very interesting study from North America. They did, they did proteomics on disease controls, knee high, surfactant protein mutations and other interstitial lung disease. And with an aptima assay, they measured over 1100 proteins. In the knee high group, there were 202 different aptimas differentiating knee high from other diseases. The surfactant protein mutations had 51 different aptimas, especially involving inflammation and fibrosis. And here you can see principal component analysis showing how two components actually separate out knee high very nicely from everything else. And they then went on to look within the knee high cluster for different endotypes, for different clusters of knee high. Is knee high uniform or could you make dif differentiate subgroups? So what they found, they had two different endotypes, two different knee highs, clinically identical, 47 proteins differing between them. And this is with a mathematical analysis, principal component analysis, not imposing the investigator's prejudice on the data, but letting the data speak for itself. So there's the heat map. And there you can see the four most different proteins between knee high cluster one and two, showing very good separation. And again, I speculate that as well as determining subtypes of knee high, could this determine new treatments? So under the knee high umbrella, there's NKX 2.1 or TTF1 mutations, different aptimas, FOXP1, possibly other gene mutations. When somebody makes a diagnosis of knee high, the next question is, what sort of knee high does the child have? What about pulmonary alveolar proteinosis? Um, you've seen the typical CT with diffuse ground glass shadowing, out outlining of the pulmonary lobules, secondary lobules. If you do biopsy them, which is not necessary, you can see here in the upper panel that the alveolar spaces are filled with proteinaceous material. In the adults, macrophage blockade, particularly due to lymphoma, is seen. We don't see this in children. We do see anti-GM CSF autoantibodies, which is adult type disease, but is seen in children. It's also seen as part of the disorders of surfactant protein metabolism. CSF receptor gene mutations. It's seen in metabolic diseases such as lysinuric protein intolerance and Nyman Pick disease. Other genetic disorders and associated with immune deficiency. There are multiple, multiple pulmonary alveolar proteinoses. So we must move from a phenotype, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, to specific endotypes, some of which I've listed, so we get the right treatment. And that is the way we need to go with interstitial lung disease.
So, so what? Well, autoimmune PAP, whole lung lavage or inhaled or subcutaneous GMCSF is excellent treatment. There's no point in giving GMCSF if there's a receptor abnormality because it just won't work. However, for the, C for the CSF receptor mutations, stem cell transplantation is curative. For sting, JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib, uh, ruxolitinib, copper, perhaps ruxolitinib, PAP complicating immune deficiency, specific treatments, including bone marrow transplant, and avoid useless whole lung lavage in the, in the metabolic condition. So we really do need to understand specific endotypes. Briefly, treatment and outcomes. Well, the treatment is usually specific, which I've shown you in a minority, or non-specific with steroids, um, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. In this study by Steve Cunningham, 127 children, uh, typical respiratory presentations, and death was likely, the prognosis is worse if you presented hypoxemic or presented at less than six months of age. So here you can see in the, the lighter gray, those who presented young were more likely to die, and those who presented hypoxemia in the light gray also more likely to die. And note that if you tried treatment, any improvement was seen within eight to 12 weeks. Also think of knee high of comorbidities. In this study, Carly Gilbert, who runs the family support group in the UK, did a questionnaire study and she found out that feeding problems were very, were very strongly associated with interstitial lung disease. So the top x-ray CT shows classical knee high, right middle lobe and mingula, you've seen it before, but you can see a large airway disease in the lower cuts, this is aspiration. And feeding issues were reported by 77% and persisted in 35%. They also identified the need for better communication better psychological support, better liaison between hospitals, and improved specialist nursing care. So in summary, what are my take home messages? We need to move towards specific genetic and environmental causes and away from just descriptive terms. That is not the way forward. Lung biopsy is not always necessary. It's a staging post. It should stimulate further investigations. And in the future, we'll be making more and more interstitial lung disease diagnosis without resorting to biopsy. And we've got to make specific genetic diagnoses if we're going to get specific treatments. And remember vaping. If you see something odd, could this be vaping? So I'd like to thank you warmly for listening. Um, and thank you again for, inv for inviting me. And I wish you success for the meeting. I also finally like to thank the funders, in particular the Enter Child, the Cost Action and Child EU. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Wen Ji Song. Um, I service in Taiwan and uh, China Medical University. Children's Hospital. Today's topic is stridle in children, diagnosis and management. Uh, just no any conflict of this uh, lecture. <clears throat> this outline of my speech. Firstly, I will. Uh, explain the clinical manifestation of the children stridal and stridal uh, is an abnormal high pitch just like this infant severe stridal this sometimes means the underlying pathology is not a diagnosis uh, usually present as a large or central airway narrowing. Uh, it involves around the glottis, supra glottis, glottis or subglottis, or in up airway, up trachea, uh, like this infant, very cyanotic and uh, severe stridal. Bernaria principle, it is means in a flow through a lumen. Once there, there 
is a narrowing section. The flow through the narrowing section, the velocity, the speed will become higher and the pressure is lower. Uh, so in the intralumen, in this se segment, the pressure lower, so the lumen will become narrowing. Uh, will become narrow in the narrow side. This picture show how the noisy breathing. This up airway from the nose down to the trachea. Different portion narrowing will produce different snowing. Uh, for example, noisy. For example, snowing in the around the soft palate or nose, and in the supraglottis, it is sometimes present with the is respiratory stridor, and in the subglottic or upper trachea, it pre, pre, produce the expiratory stridor. In the left side, in the pediatric or especially in the infant age, there are many portions of the uh, upper airway may be narrowing. For example, the nasal tract, the adenoid, or so pallid tonsil and the uh, epiglottis or uh, arytenoid process because the upper airway the dorsal aspect of upper airway is hard uh, is bone and uh, the anterior portion is soft so once the uh, narrowing the flow through the narrowing side the the lumen will become narrowing more narrow than the usual so in the narrow side, we are cause a noisy breathing. Uh, different le level have a different noise, but most important, we should be careful. Once complete obstruction or there is no flow, that means apnea. Patient no breathe, there will no noisy. That means maybe complete obstruction of the airway or uh, patient uh, doesn't have breathing. Uh, movement. How to evaluate the stridor? Once we we see a patient, a infant with stridor, we will take him detailed history about is there any congenital heart disease or any uh, intubation history uh, or any uh, surgical intervention. Mm. And uh, with the detail uh, physical is mentioned especially for the uh, stridor or for noisy uh, or for the retraction or dyspnea. The laboratory sometimes means the brackets, but in acute, acute stage, the brackets will not show any, any significant. If image, the, we take the chest x-ray and the uh, soft tissue neck, that's more important because uh, in the upper airway, the neck soft tissue, especially the later, later view, is more significant. We can show, uh, you can show any narrowing portion. CT and the MRI or even 3D uh, may be uh, meaningful. But all this is a, a static image. Uh, we recommend the flexible endoscopy is valuable because we can, by the flexible endoscopy, we can check from the upper airway, from the nose, pharynx, larynx, down to the trachea, or even bronchus. It can show dynamic image. Um, that's more valuable for a diagnosis because all we know the breathing uh, motion is dynamic. During inspiration and during expiration, the lumen is different. So we highly recommend uh, doing a flexible endoscopy for MAC diagnosis in stridal patient. What can we see with a flexible bronchoscopy? This, this picture, this video we show, just a noisy uh, stridor. The endoscope goes through the nose, through the nasal tract, down to the pharynx. We can see the structure change, dynamic structure change. 
and the, how the content is pure in the secretion or water secretion or even breathing. And the mucosa color is cyanotic or pink. And the most important is we can match the video with the noisy sound. In this picture, in this video, we can see the inspiratory collapse of the arytenol. It's a typical of inspiratory of anagol malaria. Uh, arytenoid, very floppy during inspiration, collapse broke the, the vocal inlet. That's caused the dyspnea. So we we can see from the flexible endoscopy, we can detect any part of the pathological issue in the airway. In this case, uh, the lungo malaria can be diagnosis. But uh, in the difficult or risk case uh, for airway compromise, um, patient usually combined with the cardiopulmonary status is not good. For diagnosis or even for therapeutic bronchoscopy, in this case is a high, is higher risk uh, because uh, the patient already uh, in hypoxia. During bronchoscopy, we insert a instrumentation into the airway that may more block the airway lumen, cause the lumen more narrowing. And uh, we give the sedation to calm down the patient. The sedation effect will also compromise the spontaneous breathing and uh, decrease ventilation. Therefore, the patient will become more hypoxic. That's why in many centers uh, doing the invasive bronchoscope in such risky infant or children is very challenging because the cannot maintain a good oxygenation and uh, ventilation. But in our uh, center, we practice with the so-called pharyngeal oxygen with nose close and the abdominal compression. We use this non-invasive ventilation method to keep the to support the bronchoscopy doing diagnosis and even for therapeutic purpose. This, this technique we use for since 1995 is very useful. Um, we have published many uh, medical uh, article. Uh, uh, this article just published last year. Uh, we can see from the picture, we can see this This one is an uh, oxygen caster uh, sup, sup, supply the oxygen in the upper airway and uh, through the nose and the, the, the right hand finger we just put around the nose. Um, patient have uh, spontaneous breathing and uh, the oxygen higher concentration oxygen will direct go into the trachea. And once we close the nose, uh, the, the pressure inside, the pressure inside increase, increase and uh, will expand the upper airway. Just means uh, the dilatation of upper up airway. Uh, just we can uh, use the endoscope for detail uh, check. Uh, the hand is controlled by the operator. So open and close, open and close. So the up ear will, will dynamically open and close. This cause, this uh, is a sustained pharyngeal inflation. Uh, we can use the endoscope couple with this kind of uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, for support the patient for diagnosis and even for treatment. This article, we show different time of the nose close. Uh, for one second and three second or even five second, we can see the intrapharyngeal pressure will increase linearly correlated with the uh, nose close time. Uh, in the one second, the pressure around 20, three second around 40, 
and the five seconds up to more than 60. This can be, this menu can be controlled by the endoscopy operator uh, himself. So can make a dynamic control of the upper airway lumen change and the pressure change. This is a phalanx uh, dynamic uh, image. We can see different lesions. The pharyngomalacia, uh, vulvular cyst, or epiglottic cyst, or molecular cyst. We can see the pressure change uh, from around 4 centimeter water to 20 to 40 or even higher than uh, 60 by only close nose. Uh, and uh, we can see the dynamic image. We can see the upper airway uh, image change. By this dynamic, dynamic examination, we can more accurate uh, make a diagnosis of the lesion. And uh, this picture show also shows the sustained pharyngeal inflation effect on the larynx. For example, this is a typical laryngeal malacia. By the pressure increase, we can gradually open and control the pressure inside, so make the region more more wider, more open. Uh, this is a laryngeal cleft. During low pressure, just yes, since normal, but gradually uh, expand the lumen, we can see the cleft. Uh, cleft. So that's a that's a more accurate diagnosis. This table shows the pressure effect. Uh, pressure effect uh, and from low pressure uh, gradual increase to the high pressure. The detection uh, in the low pressure only very few lesions can be diagnosed, but when in the high pressure we can detect more more lesion. Uh, so that's for accurate diagnosis. It's more more effective by this. Uh, sustain pharyngeal inflation ventilation support. Uh, this step, the, the flow chart of the flexible bronchoscope. Uh, once flexible scope dynamic diagnosis, in the traditional, we should wait for the consultation for, for surgery or for anesthesia for, for going to the uh, uh, surgery. Uh, procedure to correct the lesion, but in the traditional method, we we'll take time to to consultation on way for operation and the need for transportation to the operation room. Um, and uh, patient usually with uh, the endotracheal intubation or general anesthesia. But by this technique support, now after diagnosis, we can make direct management treatment in our PICU by all by our pediatric team. That's more convenient. That's more convenient than before. So uh, this kind of flow chart we use for more than 20 years. Uh, this, this one case, one month infant, striatal anatismia. By the flexible bronchoscope, we, we can see the endoscope through the uh, nose tract from, from the uh, phalanx, and we can see a huge cyst-like lesion, total, almost a total broke the phalanx. And uh, we inflate, open, dilated the, the space, we can see under the cyst there the epigotis, uh, epigotis flaccid, and uh, intermittent, Dynamic broke the trachea inlet. Uh, so by the endoscopy, you can directly make the diagnosis, and uh, just like the right side picture, uh, the lesion, a sister lesion, and also a compromised uh, 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 larynx. So the diagnosis of varicose cyst and the lung with the lungeal malaria can be can we get so after make diagnosis the traditional treatment uh usually medical treatment including the oxygen flow 
humidify oxygen therapy. And uh, sometimes we use inhalation medication, for example, is in, in hair steroid or adrenaline. Or some dish may be, may be infection induced, for example, pharyngeal, visual pharyngeal abscess, or tonsillitis, or adenoid infection, or trachitis. And we also maybe uh, give the anti-GE reflex medication because GE reflex will induce the, uh, will cause aspiration and induce the airway spasm and cause the stridor. And sometimes for special condition, for example, hemangioma, subclural hemangioma, we use the propranono uh, for the medication. And also the, we use a CPAP. CPAP is a uh, pneumatic stain effect. It is um, with a uh, reasonable pressure we are direct, also direct the, the airway and even alveolar will improve the lung function. Um, we use a non-invasive with nasal prong or even laryngeal mask airway. But uh, in severe case, maybe you need an intubation or even tracheostomy, depending on the uh, patient's severity. Uh, this is a medical treatment of the stridor. Mm. But however, uh, in these 20 years, we have uh, treated such case with a flexible endoscopy. Mm. For example, in airway lesion, even pharynx, pharyngeal larynx, larynx or trachea, we use the uh, forceps or laser or balloon uh, to direct lumen or cryotherapy or even put on stand. And then sometimes the combination use this above technique or instrument. For treatment, uh, this airway lesion, for example, uh, airway malaria or narrowing or granulation, tumor cyst or even uh, the foreign body all by the flexible endoscope with the uh, NIV support. This is uh, a case demonstration. For example, this case, oh, a huge cyst, uh, varicular cyst. After diagnosis, we direct use the laser to perforate the cyst and the laser fluid, uh, there's a cyst rupture and fluid content come out and uh, we can see the cyst size decrease after we treat the, the de treat the cyst and uh, we also use a laser to do the uh, epigotis malaysia you can see a retinoid inspiratory collapse uh, we also use the laser to make the plastic. This is a picture. We can see patient very calm down and focus on the video. We use the laser, KTP laser, KTP laser. So by this way, after diagnosis, and uh, we show the video to the uh, parents and uh, get the parents' uh, concern. And we direct doing the therapy immediately after the diagnosis. Uh, this, this article uh, talking about the varicose cyst and the uh, mass, just I, as I show you before, uh, we collect 18 cases. All this case is is by is diagnosis and uh, uh, therapy by flexible bronchoscope. Uh, use the uh, non-invasive ventilation support. They publish in pediatric pulmonology. This is a, the other article uh, published um, eleven years ago. Is talking about the laser therapy for diagnosis and after diagnosis we direct to the laser uh, uh, compare with the uh, 
rigid and flexible uh, bronchoscope in 30 cases. We can see from the picture, we can see uh, after laser, five days later, the structure are much improved than before the, the laser uh, within one week. This table just uh, compare from the rigid scope and the flexible scope. We can see uh, in the flexible endoscope, uh, when we do the therapy direct after diagnosis. Uh, compare the rigid scope, maybe wait for one week. And the duration for operation much shorter. Uh, for about 10 to 20, uh, about 15, 15 minutes, just complete the, 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 the therapy, scope therapy, and uh, no trachea intubation, uh, almost no need, no need of trachea intubation. And uh, the total hospital day by flexible endoscope, only around one week, is much shorter than the traditional radio scope. And the success rate, successful outcome is similar. Uh, just means by, by fresher bronchoscope, we can make diagnosis and treatment and much, uh, much effective and convenient. This is the other case of trachea stenosis. After diagnosis, we just use a laser through the flexible endoscope, direct made the operate the narrowing generation tissue. We can see the vital signs quite steep, quite steep. The patient also is very comfortable, and also medical team is also comfortable. It will take about less than 10, 10 minutes and then complete the, the laser procedure. Okay, this just show the laser flexible bronchoscopy, laser malaria, uh, before treatment and after treatment, and one month later, much improve of the structure. And this is a subglottal stenosis. We do the laser uh, plasty and much improve one month later. This is the other case, uh, stridal. Uh, they, have, they have a small hemangioma uh, over the low, low lip. And uh, we use the, have used propranonal two milligram per kilo per day, but the effect is slowly. Patients still cannot rapidly winning. Therefore, we give the, we can see, the endoscope for diagnosis. Just subglottic, a huge, a huge mass, almost complete broke the, 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 the airway. Broke the airway. Just like he, here, almost broke the airway. After we show show this picture to parents and get their uh, consent, and we direct doing the laser therapy to operate the uh, broke lesion to reduce the size of the mass and then re rebuilding, re-establish the lumen, the trachea lumen, trachea lumen. And this patient after laser operation, uh, get a rapid winning from the respiratory support. Uh, and one month later, we check again, uh, lesion, the airway so is, is open and the no must be, must effect. This is the other case of for the balloon dilatation. We can see the vital sign, patient still embracing. 
the balloon, the pressure syringe pump in the narrowing segment, we inflate the balloon. At, at this moment, uh, if we complete, we release a balloon and then we inflate the balloon again, we can see the vital sign is wonderful, wonderful. Repeat, use a balloon, inflate, and then deflate, and inflate for several times, and then uh, we establish the lumen. Usually, may combine with uh, after the laser therapy. So it's conclusion. The slide indicate a underlying polyglotic airway narrowing. A flexible endoscope can make accurate diagnosis and offer effective management, uh, just like this picture. Uh, make diagnosis and after diagnosis, we can direct offer uh, therapy. Uh, during the whole procedure, safety is most important. And uh, during endoscope procedure, uh, the procedure, the source ventilation can support oxygenation and the ventilation during flexible endoscopy. Okay, it's my, uh, I complete my lecture. So thank you for attention. Uh, any question or comment is welcome.